Um, is this on? Can everyone hear me? Yes. OK. So um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining my session. Um, I know it's the, the last session before lunch, so I kind of feel that if I'm in a conference, I always feel a little bit like a little bit tired, a little bit hungry. So to kind of get your focus on the slides a little bit for a second, let's just go to Chrome and let's go to Pizza. And then if we go to Images, then we can see some images of pizzas. Oh, you can't. <laughs> Oop. Okay, let's skip the images of pizzas. That was how I was going to get your attention, but I hope I have it now. Um, so <laughs> so um, today I want to talk about Angular in the Microservices world. And to kind of understand what I want to talk about, um, let's first take a small step back or a pretty big step back, and let's look a little bit about at software architecture in general. So um, in the old days, or maybe not that long ago, we used to create these applications using a software architecture called a monolith. And a monolith is an architecture where all the components are really tightly coupled together. So we have a front end and a back end, probably server-side rendered, talking to a single database instance. But of course, this doesn't scale on an organizational and infrastructural level. So what do we start doing? Well, we started splitting up our applications in front end and back end applications not only for the reason of not scaling, but also because newly created JavaScript frameworks, frameworks such as AngularJS gave us the option to provide our users with a better user experience. But of course, this is still not enough. So I feel that nowadays a lot of companies are trying to split up their backend into microservices. I guess with an emphasis on trying, if, if I'm being honest. Um, but I feel that in front-end development, development, we've not yet taken the necessary steps to do that split up as well. I feel that we're often still creating small monoliths in the front end, and that kind of poses a lot of problems. So that's what I want to tackle in my talk today. I want to see what we can learn from some of the steps that have been taken in the microservices world, and how we can apply some of those principles in front end development, because of course you can't just take them over, um, and how we can actually do that. So, a little bit about myself. My name is Quinton. Um, this is a picture from when I used to have hair. Now I look a little bit more like this. Um, I'm from Belgium. I'm a freelance front-end architect. I'm also a meetup organizer. I co-founded a company called Strongbrew, um, and this is my Twitter handle. Uh, a little bit about Strongbrew. It's a company that does trainings around Angular, RxJS, and NGRX um, all over Europe. We also have a blog called blog.strongbrew.io. I recently published a free video course on how you can build the operators from RxJS from scratch, so definitely check that out. Um, and I also created something together with Dominic, who's in front here, called Angular Checklist, which is a, a website where you can find a list of curated best practices that we feel that every application should kind of follow, so definitely check that out. But to get um, to see what we can learn from microservices, we first need to took, take a look at some of the differences, because there are quite some differences. For example, first difference is the runtime. When I develop a backend service, then that backend service is going to be deployed in my cloud environment. And I have 100% control over that cloud environment. I can choose the server I'm running it on. I can choose the technology that I'm using. We have control over that. While with front-end development, we're not, host, we're not running our application inside of our cloud environment. We're hosting the static files in our cloud environment, but we're running the application inside of the browser. And that's a huge difference, because we do not control the browser. In a worst-case scenario, you still have to support IE. That's not what we want, but unfortunately it is. So that's a huge difference. The second huge difference is the process. When I have a back-end service, I'm going to run that back-end service maybe in a Docker container, on my cloud environment. And when it's running in my cloud environment, it means that, well, I control the process, and if I want to communicate with another service developed by another team, well, I'm going to use protocols. We have REST, we have some eventing system. So as long as whatever language that we choose or whatever technology that we choose to use, if it can work with those protocols, it means that we can use it in our backends because they can communicate with each other. In front-end development, it's totally different, because everything that we're going to create that builds up our application is going to run in the same JavaScript thread. We only have one thread. That means that everything that we use needs to be automatically compatible. We really need to think about versions and compatibility and stuff like that. And that's a huge differentiator compared to microservices, which makes it a lot more difficult. So 
to kind of understand how I feel that a lot of companies are building applications nowadays, let's look at an overview, and this is a deployment overview. So in our backend, we have some microservices. These microservices communicate to each other through protocols. Doesn't really matter now. Um, and on top of that, we have some Angular applications. We can have, for example, four Angular applications. They all communicate to some API integration layer. They all use a UI kit so that they look a little bit like the same application or from the same company. And we also have some features that are developed on top of that. That's a deployment overview. And from a deployment overview, this actually makes sense. Because we have applications that, are, that can be uh, independently deployed, uh, that are developed, um, they're communicating to some APIs, so that makes sense. I want to keep this. But the problem is, is if, we, if we take this overview and we look at how it's being developed, so if we look at it from a team overview, then it looks something like this. So we have four applications, and I feel a lot of companies nowadays are developing these applications, one for each team. So we have one team developing one application, and the main problem with this is that I feel that these teams are not communicating. They are not communicating how they do stuff, what they are working on, um, they are not sharing any code, and that poses a problem. If we look at how it works in a microservices world, services are developed by teams who are specialists in a certain business domain. Services are modeled around business domains, and that's not what we're doing in the front end. In the front end, we just have a team who does uh, an application which is going to use some services, and we say, okay, you can do this and you do that, but we don't communicate. And that's not what we want. What do I want? I want to stop thinking in terms of teams developing applications. I want to start thinking of what features do I need to develop? What API integration layers do I need? What am I going to do for a component library? And then when we think of that, so instead of terms, thinking of applications, we think in terms of features. And this is also something that Dan talked about this morning. This is like a step you need to take. When we do this, we can assign teams features based on their knowledge and their expertise. So we could say, like, you can develop this and you can develop this. And then we're no longer sh duplicating that code. We only have one team working on a certain API integration layer. So how does that work in terms of applications? Well, an application should, first of all, when we do something like this, we need to be able to share code. So if we want to share code, it means that we need to work in some modular way. And when I think about a modular way of working in front-end development, it makes, it makes me think of Angular. Angular provides us with uh, a lot of options to be able to really easily share code. So how does that work in terms of applications? Well. Every application is just a build-up out of different features. We have teams developing features, and every application can just choose whatever feature they need. So if a certain application needs to use uh, a certain API integration layer, well, they can just bundle that inside of their application. That's a total different mindset, and that's something that I feel that we're not doing nowadays. And I've actually did this at a client of mine, and it can actually save a lot of code. How many times have the same APIs been developed in TypeScript to communicate to the same backend service? Over and over again. By doing this, we can kind of make sure that it doesn't happen anymore. But of course, we need to share this code. And how can we share code? Well, the first thing that springs to mind is NPM. We're going to put everything in a small box. We're going to set up a build system. I'm going to put it on NPM, and everyone can use it. Who's used NPM before to publish something? OK, that's the majority who enjoyed doing that. That's about 10% of the people that put their hand up first. I also don't enjoy doing that. Um, it's a lot of problems. If I have a UI kit, and I develop that UI kit for Angular 7, for example, and another team already upgrades to Angular 8, I need to publish a new version of my library so they can use it. And then another team comes to me, and they're still on Angular 6, and they have a bug, so I need to fix that bug, so I need to do a hotfix release of an old tag, and then I need to make sure that the change that I made here is also in the other one, so I need to deploy three different versions for all of the that's, that's a huge pain in the ass. I don't want to do that. So what can we do? What's the, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is using a monorepo. What is a monorepo? A monorepo is a place where you put all of the code, all of the front-end code for your orga organization into a single repository. And the first time that someone told me, I felt a little bit like this. Thank you. 
Why? Why would you do that? But after someone explained it to me, it started making a lot of sense. So when we have a monorepo, well, inside of a monorepo, if all of the code is in there, we can make sure that we have only one package JSON file. If you only have one package JSON file, it means you can only have one dependency on a certain version of Angular. If you only have one version of Angular in your monorepo, what does that mean? Everything that gets created is automatically compatible. Remember that all of the code that we write by different teams, once we put it together in an application, it means it needs to be compatible because it's going to run in the same JavaScript thread. So this is a huge, huge win, in my opinion. Another huge win is that I like it when I go to an organization and they have some standards for, for linting and stuff. Well, in a monorepo, you can have one tslint JSON file that's being used for all of the code. So it is automatically going to be updated. Whenever I change something, everyone needs to comply to that. If I change from team A to team B, it's going to be the same linting rules that I need to follow. So that, that's a huge win. One thing I want to say about this is that a monorepo is not the same as a monolith. This is often confused. A monolith is a software architecture where everything is tightly coupled. A monorepo, on the other hand, is a way to structure the code, but you can still have a modular approach inside of a monorepo. And that's what we're going to try to do. So what I like to use for my monorepo is NX. And NX is something that's created by uh, the people who founded Narwhal. So that was two ex-Googlers, two ex-Angular team members, Jeff Cross, and uh, Victor Sefkin, and they released NX, which is a really thin layer on top of the CLI, as I'll show next, and this will help us facilitate the development of a monorepo. Some of you might be thinking like, okay, I know that in Angular CLI version 6, I can also have multiple projects. That's 100% true, but with a monorepo, you also have some difficulties, and NX will help us facilitate to handle those difficulties, as we'll see. So, to kind of show how it works, let's take a look at an example front-end. And notice the fact that I'm using front-end here. I'm not saying example application. Because I feel that in a company, when we are creating software by different teams, different applications, our users should know that. Our users should have a consistent look and feel and a consistent behavior over the entire application. If your user switches from app A to app B, he shouldn't really know that. So we are more building front-ends or platforms instead of applications. So let's say that for our example front-end, we have two applications. We have a web shop and a stock management uh, application. Um, and again, this is what Dan talked about this morning, thinking about features. This is something you need to do in advance, so you can give different teams the, um, the order to implement the different features. And then we also have a UI kit, product, payment, auth, and stock. Webshop is going to use some of these modules. Stock management is going to use some of these modules, and that's how we build them up. So how do we do this with NX? Well, the first thing that we need to do is, well, we need to, have, um, we need to create a workspace. And this is the only non-standard Angular thing that we're going to do to use NX. We're going to use a binary called create NX workspace. We're going to give it the name demo. That's the name of my workspace. And this is going to generate, uh, I'm not going to do it live because it takes a little bit too long time. Um, this is going to generate uh, a workspace. And that workspace is basically nothing more than an Angular CLI project with a little bit different configuration. So you can see that we have uh, an apps and a libs folder. Uh, you can see that we still have uh, one package JSON file, uh, one tsconfig JSON file, and that's it. So that's what it generates. Now, what are those apps and those libs? So the first thing that NX gives us is kind of an opinionated folder structure. So what are they saying? They are saying, well, let's identify two blocks. We have applications, and an application is basically something that we're going to build and something that we're going to deploy. But an application shouldn't contain any logic. All of the logic that we have and everything that we want to share, or all the modules that we had in, in the previous slide, that's something we're going to put in libraries. And a library is a, just a folder with some TypeScript files that might expose an Angular module, but doesn't necessarily have to. Um, but that's something that we're going to create, and that's what we're going to bundle inside of our application. So a library is shared code, and an application is basically nothing more than an aggregation of different libraries. That's our folder structure. The way you structure these can be 
quite hard. And uh, on our blog, we have um, some opinionated guidelines for how you can structure your libraries for large NX workspaces. So um, when we take a look at our example front end, we can identify very easily that we have two applications and that we have five libraries. That's it. Next thing that NX gives us, well, we have schematics. So whenever you run ng generate component, under the hood, something called a schematic is going to run to scaffold out some code. NX uses that feature to allow us to really easily generate applications and libraries. So when we want to create our application, what we could do is we could say generate app, generate app for the uh, two applications, and we can generate some libraries for, uh, for all of the uh, feature modules that we had. So that's how we generate them, really easy, like everyone's used to. Um, and then, well, we can start linking, linking stuff together. So what we could do is we have our app module. This is for the stock management. And what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to import all of the feature modules that this one uses. I'm importing them directly here. It's probably a better idea to do it lazy loaded, but to keep it on the slide, I'm doing it directly here. So this is pretty standard, I would say. But what's a little bit different is the way that we're going to import these. So remember, we have a monorepo, so we just have one folder structure with everything in there. Well, how do we import these? I'm going to use um, import stock module, and I'm going to import it from at demo slash stock. And that's a little weird, but I'm going to explain it. So we're importing it, and we're using always the same structure. So we're always going to have at, then the npm scope, slash, and then the name of the library. That's how we reference it. Again, this is not an NX feature. This is something from TypeScript. It's called a path mapping. So what is a path mapping? A path mapping allows us to, inside of our tsconfig.json file, define that a certain route, for example, at demo slash UI kit, that it points to a certain folder. So we are pointing to um, lips slash UI kit slash source slash index ts. Whenever TypeScript interprets our code, it's going to map whatever we put on the previous slide here to so whatever we put here. It's going to interpret that and map it to the path that we defined. One thing that's really important here is we're pointing to an index.ts file. Why are we doing that? Well, we should treat all of the libraries that we have as actual libraries. We don't want any leaky abstractions. We only want people to use whatever is available in our public API. But of course, we know we are human. We make mistakes. Um, our IDEs take the wrong import, so we need some way to uh, protect ourselves from that. And to do that, NX provides us another feature. They provide us a common TS lint rule. And they have a common TS lint rule that will make sure that we only communicate to the public API of our application. And I'm quickly going to show you how that works. If I can get the screen working at least. Uh, that should be better, yes. So how does that work? Well, if I go to the, um, for example, I go to the uh, app module for my stock management, app module, and then I try to do an import, so I'm importing from at demo slash payment, so if I do imp at import uh, source, then it's going to complain here, it's probably not readable, but it says that it's forbidden to do, to do deep imports into libraries. So that's something that NX gives us to make sure that we don't make any mistakes in our imports. And that's really important. Second thing that it gives us, if you think about a monorepo, if I think about a monorepo and all of the code is in there, I maybe want to make sure that nobody kind of fucks it up. Because, well, if I have a UI kit module and someone um, accidentally imports the stock module inside of my UI kit module, it means that everyone who uses the UI kit module is also going to get the stock module. And that's not what we want. So using the same TS lint rule, we can define the relationships that are allowed inside of our application, inside of our monorepo. And that's really, really important to make sure that our monorepo is going to scale over time. So how does that work? Well, we also have an NXJSON file. And in this NXJSON file, we can give every application an array of tags. For example, in this use case, I'm giving uh, the UI kit a tag of UI. And then using that information inside of the tsln.json file, we can define what can rely on what. 
For example, I'm saying here that uh, a source tag, when I, I have a feature, that can only depend on a UI and a util lib. So, for example, oops, let's go back. If I go here, so let's stop this, um, and I go to the payment module, for example, and I try to do an import to another feature module, which I defined that's not allowed. So if I try to import the stock module, for example, then it's going to complain here, and it's going to say, uh, a project tagged with lint feature can only depend on features tagged with UI and util. So by really thinking about this and defining clear boundaries on what can import what, we can make sure that our monorepo can scale over time and that we don't accidentally make any mistakes, which can easily happen. In the beginning, they didn't have this rule. It was quite a pain in to get it right. So next. So this is our example front end. Um, this is what we've built. I've linked everything together, generated the applications, the workspace, linked everything together. Makes sense. We can assign different teams to develop this. But if you look at this and you know what microservices are, this kind of feels like a town plan. So what is a town plan? It's an overview of all backend services and how they communicate with each other. And I've worked with a, quite a lot of clients who claim they have a town plan, but their town plan is never up to date. Never. But we can get this, what we've drawn here, we can get it from NX for free. So what can NX do? And I'm first going to show it. NX is going to analyze our code, and then it's going to generate an overview of all of the modules that we have and how they are related to each other. So by analyzing our code, NX knows that, for example, if I, in my payment module, have an import to, or in my webshop app module application, I have an import to add demo slash payments. Well, NX using static code analysis and dependency graph resolution, it knows that, okay, my webshop depends on my payment module. So this is, to me, very awesome because it means that if you're in a big organization, you can generate this, and this is always going to be up to date. You could even generate this as part of your build. So that's, I believe, very cool. Next, how do we build this? And this is something that, that bothered me for, for a long time. I didn't, I didn't understand how it would work. Because normally, if I do a commit to my uh, Git repo, I would just trigger a CI build, and that would run my testing, my linting, and my end-to-end -end testing. But how do you do that if you have 10 applications and 40 developers? That's, that's never going to work. So what did NX do? Well, they provide us with some build scripts. And these build scripts using the same dependency graph that they generated uh, in the previous slide, or what I showed before, it's going to tell you what needs to be updated. So let's go to the code again. And in my code, I have a readme file. And now you're just going to have to trust me for a second. Um, and this, so what you can do is you can run this script, and then you can give it two commit hashes. And in this commit, I only made a change to UI module. So if I take this, and then I run this, it's going to analyze the code, and it's going to say, OK, the change that you've made to the UI kit means that all of these applications were impacted. If I do the same thing and I run libraries, so I can do it for lips as well, it's going to analyze my code, and it's going to say, oh, the UI kit is impacted by what you've changed. So by statically analyzing the code and by knowing, like, in this commit you changed that file, that file belongs to that library, that library is used by this and this and this other library or other application, well, we can use that information to only build and test and end-to-end -end test and lint whatever has changed. And that makes sure that our monorepo can scale uh, on our uh, CI environments. Of course, this is something that will probably be uh, replaced by Bazel over time, but we can already start using this today, and that's really <coughs> powerful. So, what is NX? NX is nothing more than a really thin layer on top of the CLI that helps us facilitate the development of a monorepo. Nothing more than that. And that's actually really cool, um, because I always tend to look at application. Whenever I use something, I always want to make sure, like, how does that impact? What if NX stops developing it? And all of that stuff. Well, they only use features from the CLI, so it's not really that big of an impact to introduce this in your organization. One quote I want to um, look at before we kind of 
finish up is one from Alex Eagle, who does the uh, integration at the Basel team, uh, the Basel integration at the Google team for Angular. And he says, if you don't have a monorepo, you're not really doing continuous integration. You're doing near future integration at best. And this really resonates with me because, well, if you have a monorepo, if I have an NPM package and I decide to publish a new change, hopefully, hopefully, I've tested it in an application and not a playground application, but a real application. But no way have I tested that NPM publish in everything that I impacted. So if I publish it, I might get called that evening at 8, 8 p.m. because some automatic deploy release cycle broke something because of the change that I made. If I work in a monorepo and I commit something, that's automatically going to trigger a build, and that build is going to check, OK, you made a change to this library, you impacted this other, these other libraries and these applications, I'm going to see if you didn't break anything. So by using a monorepo, I have way, way more confidence that what I'm doing is not impacting other applications and other teams. And that, to me, is like the main reason I would use it. So kind of summarizing, what do I want, to, want you to take away from this? I think we need to stop thinking in terms of applications and teams and linking those together, but we need to think about what, we'll, what do we want to develop inside of our entire organization, make teams develop features, and let applications be built up out of different features built by different teams. The best way, in my opinion, to do that, to have that code sharing and that communication is to use a monorepo. One thing I want to add here is that monorepos are not all rainbow and sunshine. Um, there are some difficulties when it comes to monorepo development, uh, which NX helps us to facilitate, but doesn't fix entirely. Like, for example, how will you make sure that all of the 10 teams agree when to do a certain Angular upgrade, for example. So it does need to be something that's supported by your organization. If your organization does not understand the uh, benefits of a monorepo, they will not support it. So that's, um, but again, with everything in software development, it's all about trade-offs. And to me, the, the benefits of a monorepo are way, way higher than the, than the downsides. So these are some references from talks that I used. Um, and that was it. Thank you very much.